Hello, my name is Bob Nelms, and I'd like to talk to you about the combing process, another way of determining investigative targets. In the classroom, we suggested defining thresholds in each area to identify investigative targets. This is probably familiar to you, but the initial activities of the area advocate were to sit down with their area managers and establish maxi, midi, and mini LCA thresholds. Now again, that's one way of defining investigative targets in each area. But there's another way. There's another way of determining investigative targets that is almost always revealing, and it almost always gets a wow from the people who do it. And that other way is called the combing process, a process that was developed by Failsafe in the 1980s that we've used on many processes. It is a six-stepped process. It's very easy. As I go through this exercise, imagine that you are an area advocate. Try to relate this to whatever area you might work in. So step number one would be where you would acknowledge the primary flow through your area, whatever area that might be. You might be making donuts. There's going to be a flow of donuts through your area. You might work on an oil rig. There's going to be a flow of crude oil or gas through that, through that oil rig. You might be working with some kind of procedure. Uh, there will be a flow through that procedure, a flow of work perhaps. So step number one is to acknowledge the primary flow through your area. Examples of primary flow through areas are these. By the way, all of these examples are things we've actually done this on. Paper through a paper machine. Oil through a pipeline. Nylon through a spinning area. Dollars through an organization tasks in a critical job, paperwork through an office, or work from one department to another. That's step number one, it was, is to acknowledge this primary flow through your area. Now step number two is where you're going to define failure for that flow. And you shouldn't do this yourself. You should go to the head of your area, just like you did when establishing thresholds the other way, and then ask the head to define success for that flow. That is, what is most critical to you over the next 12 months related to that flow you've already defined. And then the reciprocal of success is going to be failure. The area advocate is responsible for doing this in his or her area. Try your best to get your area manager to focus. This, that is essential for success of the combing process. Get the area manager to focus on one thing, depending on what the flow is through the area. And that one thing is probably going to be production losses, or quality problems, or safety incidents, or environmental excursions, or costs, or something else. The point is any one of those things is what you should focus on for failure, not all of them. And then step number three is actually quite fun. Draw a contact diagram for that flow. If you work in a, a production area, you'll probably want to get the PNIDs out, uh, but that's not going to be good enough for this. In fact, I should say it differently, that's going to be too good for this. There's too much deal on a PNID. So you can use the PNID as a baseline perhaps, but, but ask yourself this, what elements of the process does the primary flow come in contact with as it flows through the process.
because the flow of oil, for example, won't come in contact with everything in the production area. There will be ancillary things going on that won't come in contact with that flow. So draw a contact diagram for the flow. For example, paper through a paper machine, oil through a pipeline, nylon through a spinning area. What actual elements come in contact with the nylon and with the oil and with the paper? Dollars through an organization. Who, who actually has their hands on the dollars as it's flowing through the organization? Tasks in a critical job, paperwork through an office, work from one department to another. What comes in contact with the primary flow through that area? Step number four, remember there's only six steps, and this is step number four is assemble hands-on expertise. This is going to be fascinating. Try to get operations involved and try to get at least three from operations so that we have at least three different opinions or perspectives. Then try to get maintenance people involved, especially if this is a production unit where there's actually maintenance that's being done. And don't forget electrical maintenance. So mechanical and electrical maintenance. And then get some technical folks involved, at least two, hopefully three. And then that area manager that area manager is going to want to be here. All of these people are going to learn a whole lot by going through this process. This is going to be very valuable. So step number five, now that we have this hands-on expertise that's been assembled, is we're going to comb the contact diagram for failure. You know, think of this as a, a flea comb, and you're, f and you're combing a dog for fleas. But this is going to be a very specific flea comb. It's only going to find fleas. It's not going to find ticks. It's not going to find burrs. It's going to look for one thing. Fleas. Or with our exercise, it's going to look for one thing. It's going to look for whatever our definition of failure was. Let's suppose our definition of failure is anything that causes a loss of production. If it causes injuries, we're not going to consider that right now. If it causes quality issues, we're not going to consider that right now. Whatever the definition of failure is, we're going to relentlessly focus on that. For example, anything that happens out there that causes a loss of production. So we're going to take the comb and we're going to pull the comb down and we're going to look at one element of the contact diagram at a time. And we're going to ask those assembled people, remember operations, maintenance, technical and management are all there. And we're going to ask them, does anything happen at this point on the contact diagram that meets our definition of failure? Or that causes a loss of production, for example and they're going to have answers or not. I'm going to show you what to do with what they say in a minute. And then we pull the comb down to the next element on the contact diagram. Does anything happen at this point that causes a lo loss of production? And at this point, you see how easy this is? It's because it's so focused. All kinds of things come out that not everybody will know about. Oh, individual people will know about them, but the whole group won't know about all these things. That's what makes this so valuable. Now I'm, I'm going to backtrack a little here. I'm going to remind you of what we do. We focus on each block in the contact diagram, one block at a time, asking three questions. Does anything happen at this point on the contact diagram which meets our definition of failure? And if so, what is it? And then how often does it occur? What is the frequency of that failure? And also, what is the average impact each time it occurs? 
in terms of the failure that we're looking for. If we're looking for production loss, what kind of production loss do we get each time it occurs? It's easy now. Remember, what happens at this point that causes a loss of production? How often does it how often does it happen? And what is the average impact in terms of production loss each time it happens? Pulling the comb through each element on the contact diagram, one element at a time. So how do we log the information on this? Well, you either paper a wall and create this chart on the wall, or you can have a, a laptop ready and project something on, on a screen and type it in as you hear it. I like the paper version. It's easier for me. Uh, one element at a time. Now this is a very simplified uh, combing chart just so I can explain what we put on the chart. In the left hand column is the element. Description of the element. There's a storage tank, a pump, a pipeline, a control valve, an extruder, and a collecting bin. Remember the question, does anything happen at the storage tank? that causes a loss of production. And they say, yes, it leaks. Oh, really? How often does it leak where it causes a loss of production? Well, every two years. All right. Now, on the average, each time it does leak, how many pounds do we lose per occurrence? What is the production loss per occurrence? Well, about 100 pounds. All right, then what is the annualized loss? Well, if we have 100 pounds that we lose every two years, that's 50 pounds of annual loss. Does anything else happen at the storage tank that causes a loss of production? Well, yeah, sometimes it plugs up. Oh, okay, how often does that happen? And, you know, they talk. And they're, with all these different perspectives, they come up with a pretty good estimate of you know how often it happens. And they say, well, about four times a year. And what is the impact per occurrence? 100 pounds. Annual loss? Well, four times a year at 100 pounds each, it's 400 pounds. Now, I'm not going to go through the whole chart. I don't want to bore you to tears. But just look at that last one the collecting bin. Does anything happen at the collecting bin that causes a loss of production? Well, yeah, they overflow. Oh, really? How often does it overflow? About once a day. And what is the loss per occurrence? About 20 pounds. Well, once a day, uh, 365 times 20 is going to be 7,300 pounds. And everybody looks at each other, and they see all the numbers in the chart, and they realize, oh my goodness, oh my goodness. So now that we have tabulated everything that they know of or they can remember, we add up all the losses right there in front of everybody. And if you add up all of those losses that are on that chart, it'll add up to 10,701 pounds. Well, we need to make sure that we've accounted for all the losses. And believe me, this is part of the wow factor here. So you might want to go back and listen to this a couple of times. It's not complicated to do. It's just a little complicated to talk about. So the first thing we're going to do to make sure we've accounted for all the losses is calculate the total available production in your unit or the maximum production rate in pounds per hour times 24 hours a day times 365 days a year. For example, if you have a production unit that, pr that can produce at its maximum 20 pounds an hour then 20 pounds an hour times 24 hours a day times 365 days a year is 175,200 pounds a year. All right, so we've got that figure. 
Now we go back and based on production history, we calculate the average annual production from our records, maybe over the last five years. And in this case, the average annual production over the last five years is 155,000 pounds a year. So now pay attention because this is easy, but it's critical. The losses we have to account for then is the difference between those two. If we have a unit capable of producing 175,200 pounds and the average over the last five years is only 155,000 pounds, then we have a gap, a gap of 20,200 pounds that we have to account for. And we've only accounted for 10,791. Now what I'm doing right now is exactly what the people in the room do when we compare those two numbers because we thought we've accounted for everything and we've only accounted for half of it and they go back and they think and they talk and they remember oh well we didn't account for X did we or we didn't account for Y what about that scheduled downtime we have every year we didn't account for that scheduled downtime what about the catalyst change that we have to do once every five years that takes us down for you know three two months and then and all these other things get thrown in there until those two numbers are as close as we can get try this I guarantee this is what's going to happen. The whole group of people in there are going to know their area a whole lot better than when they walked in there to begin with. And the manager is going to be especially interested in all of this. All right, that's step five. Now step six, we're, we're, we're there, we're, we're done. Now what we're going to do is we're going to take that chart with all those numbers on it and Pareto-ize it. This is an actual Pareto chart of, a, uh, of an exercise we did in a nylon plant. And there were, there were uh, it says 25, I think there were like 150 things that went wrong in that nylon plant that they all told us about. We Paretoized it and only two, two of those events that happened in that nylon plant accounted for 80% of the loss. Two. And the two that accounted for 80% of the loss weren't even being investigated. Part of the wow factor is in, in, in realizing you're investigating all these little things when all the losses are coming from these two things. Of course, a Pareto analysis is, is trying to find out where the 80-20 split is. And we're always looking for the 80-20 split. Try doing this in any one of your process areas. If I'm not being clear enough in this short vlog, you know, give us a ring. I'd be glad to help. This is easy stuff. So the combing process. A review. Number one, acknowledge the primary flow through your area, whatever area you might work in. Number two, define failure for that flow. You better go to your manager and ask him to help you or her to help you with this. Number three, draw a contact diagram for that flow. If you have to use PNIDs as a baseline, sure, that's fine, but don't use the whole PNID. Number four, assemble hands-on expertise, as many as you can get. Number five, with that hands-on expertise, comb the contact diagram. What happens at this point that causes a, uh, a loss of production, for example? And how often does it happen? And what's the impact every time it happens? And once you have the whole thing, make sure you've accounted for everything and then Pareto-wise the results. Now let's go back to the class that we teach where we suggest drawing thresholds. Now I don't know if you realize this, but the thresholds often don't pick up little things. In fact, that's the whole point of the threshold is to go after 
high impact events. But what if we have a little thing that happens frequently? If all we do is have these thresholds and we have these little things that happen frequently, we're never going to investigate them because each individual impact isn't high enough for us to investigate. That's why the combing process is valuable because the combing process will absolutely catch those high frequency events and it will probably throw them right in to the upper levels of the Pareto chart. I hope you understand the combing process. It's another way of determining investigative targets. Thanks a lot.